Okay, so I'll invite Mika Nishimura and the next panel to join me on the stage. I know you guys need microphones. So we've spent a lot of time, um, actually let me, let me start this in a different place. So when I first started my career in Silicon Valley, it was actually 20 years ago this year. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> it was after my PhD, so now you can date me exactly. Um, and I can remember uh, in the first 10 years of my career in Silicon Valley, hearing the word reimbursement exactly never. Okay. Yeah, okay, so we're going to need some help with the furniture. Um, yeah, I remember hearing the word reimbursement like never in the first 10 years of my career in Silicon Valley. Then, the last 10 years of my career in Silicon Valley, I barely go a day without hearing it. And in fact, um, I started counting earlier today, like how many times we mentioned the word reimbursement, and I actually stopped counting after like 50. Um, and so we keep referencing this monolithical thing that we're all going after, right, which is, you know, how do we get paid? Because for the most part, for the most part, we're all in for-profit businesses uh, in the room. Not everybody, but for the most part. And we do actually need to do well while we do good. And that is um, hard. And it's even harder when you imagine going into new geographies that have very different payment models, very different expectations of evidentiary standards to get paid. And so the question is like giant, it's a giant egg question of what do you do, how do you do it, how do you break it down? So Mika is going to introduce the panel and uh, you guys give us all the answers. We're waiting, we've been waiting. Yeah. So as Deborah said, um, this panel's all about getting paid. And I don't know about you, but I'm a commercial person. My background is all in commercial, so I love getting paid. Uh, <laughs> personally, but also for the company, because I mean, after all, you put in all that hard work. You know, you did the needs assessment, you developed the product, you know, you went through the trials and tribulations of doing the clinical studies, you even got the FDA and the CMR, but until you actually get somebody to pay for your technology, your patients are not going to benefit from it. Your investors are not going to get their payback. Your employees may not have the career that they wanted. And so it really matters to, I think, all of us, whether you are um, in the for-profit world or not-for-profit world. So, but it is a daunting topic. Um, and I've struggled through how to get paid, you know, for the last 25 years of my commercial career. But if any, people can actually demystify this a little bit, um, I think it's going to be this super panel uh, that I've got with me. So I'll introduce the panel in just a minute, um, but just to set the stage for you, we know that it's after lunch, and that's kind of a challenging time um, of the agenda, so we're going to actually have a little bit of audience participation, so be aware of that. And then we're going to go into some case studies, because when you talk about getting paid and getting paid in multiple markets outside of the US, like where do you even begin to do that? You can spend like a whole week on this topic. So we just wanted to give you a little taste of that by walking you through a couple of case studies. So we asked a couple of the pan panelists to do that. Um, and then we want you to go away with some tangible, some two, three points that you might remember uh, from this afternoon's topic. So we'll do the top 10 um, and then open up for Q&A. Um, so that's the structure of the, the, um, the next hour or so. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, so I started my career um, at Guidant in international marketing. And those were the good old days, as Deb said, that we didn't really actually have to worry so much about getting paid. I, um, and so my first actually day on the job was to fly to Zermatt, Switzerland to ski with the distributors. That was my job. <laughs> uh, so things were kind of like really easy back then. Uh, but then things kind of started to change. I spent about a decade at Guide in all international sales and marketing in Europe and Japan and emerging markets. Um, and then did similar sort of thing at EV3 with Stacy um, over there. We built that international business. Getting paid was getting harder. Um, back then. The last um, few years I've been in women's health um, with early stage companies. Getting paid was getting a lot harder um, now. And I also wear a different hat. Um, you may see my bio as an operational partner with Gilda Healthcare. We're a transatlantic venture fund. We just closed our fourth fund, um, raised 250 million euros in a war chest. If anybody's looking for money, you can come and talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> what a few investors still doing that. 
Um, but one of the things that we care as a late stage investor is, does the company have line of sight to getting paid? So that's also a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So that's about me. I'm going to go around the, the panel and ask the panelists to introduce themselves. Yeah, I'm uh, Katya Schroeder. So I've um, yeah, also 20 years of experience in healthcare, starting with pharmaceutical uh, for sales and um, sales leadership, then changed to medtech and uh, medical devices and marketing and uh, marketing leadership. So for, I mean, from Germany, so started with a lot of focus in Germany and then also uh, entered into European roles. And uh, with the strategic marketing, you get closer and closer to questions of market access and reimbursement. And that's how I later then moved into this field and to Kanz and Partner <coughs> Consulting, where I am now. And we are um, consulting companies we have with respect to market access and reimbursement. But since we have many facets of um, operational experience also in our team, we, we extend this upon customers' needs or work with partners on that. And Anne Smart, I'm a director with Navigate Consulting based in New York City. I have over 20 years of experience across the healthcare industry. Basically, I started my career on the pharma side, um, sorry. Um, <laughs> then I moved under the provider side where I worked at a couple large academic medical centers and now have been in strategy consulting for the past 10 years. I came to Navigant via the acquisition of Easton Associates, which was a boutique life sciences strategy consulting firm. Um, and really, it, you know, I focus solely on the medical t uh, tech, med tech, med device clients, diagnostic clients, and we really help our clients in two different ways. First, we support a lot of commercial due diligence as they think about making acquisitions and investment decisions. And then we also um, work on developing market access and market development strategies for new technologies really around the world. So a lot of, as all you know, a lot of the opportunities are outside the U.S., so we spend quite a bit of work um, focused on these developed and developing markets outside the U.S. to really understand the different barriers and different factors that influence getting optimal access for your technology. Oops. Yeah. Um, my name is Naomi Sofa, and I'm currently the director of market access for Quorum Consulting, which is a small boutique reimbursement strategy consulting firm in San Francisco down in the financial district. And the reason I'm here on the panel is I've worked almost every commercial function one can think of in the life sciences industry, but a lot of my experience comes with molecular diagnostics and did launch a molecular diagnostic with, um, with a companion pharmaceutical at Monogram Biosciences where I worked a lot with Latin America, um, especially Brazil, so I'll be able to speak to that today. And um, also prior to working for Quorum, I was a business advisor for the government of New Zealand, helping healthcare companies commercialize here in the US. So a little bit of the reverse, but it does give you some interesting insight into what it is to come into our health system and understand the differences with um, coming from a universal uh, payer system. So. Hi, I'm Leslie Stevens, and um, I'm in health economics and market access at Abbott. Um, I started my career at Guidant, which became Abbott, and I did the first 10 years of my post-grad school career in truly commercial roles. I was in marketing, um, as many of you in this room work with me too. <laughs> um, and about five years ago, I had the opportunity to start to think about things differently, and I was given an opportunity you mentioned not having heard reimbursement. Well, I hadn't heard reimbursement except for talking to Marika um, for most of those 10 years either. And in fact, my first day on the job, and I apologize to all my public health professors, I had to Google DRG again. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what it was. <laughs> um, so we didn't talk about it at all. And I view market access, um, which kind of combines the health economics and market access um, or reimbursement into market access as marketing to a different customer. And until we, um, the previous group talked about innovation for innovation's sake is no longer meaningful. And if you don't have a value story, then you can't go anywhere. And this, this function in combination with marketing is what really creates the value story. And so I think about it as marketing to a different customer. Okay. Great. So I promised you audience participation, so we're gonna kick it off. So easy question first. How many of you 
are working currently for a company that has tried to get reimbursement somewhere in Europe. Raise your hand. Okay, looks like about half. What about Asia Pacific? Okay, great. Latin America? Oh, actually, quite a few. Great. All right, now it gets a harder one. All right, your product, this actually came from a client of mine in my consulting days. You got C mark. Great, now you're ready to commercialize and get reimbursement all across 27 member countries in the EU. How many of you think that that's true? <laughs> <laughs> all right, Katya, just a short comment on that. How many times have you heard that from one of your clients? <laughs> Yes, fortunately, those who are approaching us as our clients are already did one step further in their thought process. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's usually something that, you do, but that uh, we do not need to explain, but there is still a lot of explanation needed on the, how these markets function. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, FDA approval status. Does that have any sway whatsoever in getting reimbursement in international markets? How many would say yes? Couple hands, okay, yeah, few hands, great. No. Or this is the cop-out answer, it depends, or Naomi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Naomi, can I ask you to comment on that? Yeah, so um, FDA clearance or approval is just one piece of the puzzle. There's all sorts of regulatory hurdles that you would need to go through, device classification. For example, in Brazil, there's meetings with the Ministry of Health. You may have a special agency that you're meeting with. So certainly, it, it, it's going to add to the data points that those agencies are collecting, but it certainly isn't a slam dunk just with FDA uh, clearance or approval. All right, now the degree of difficulty just went up. Nice in the UK. By the way, bonus given to somebody who can actually spell out what NICE stands for. <laughs> NICE in the UK just issued a positive health technology assessment, or HTA. That leads to funding by the National Health Services in the UK. True or false? True. How many people think that that's true? Wow, this is a sophisticated <laughs> crowd. <laughs> All right, so Anne, could you comment on that? <laughs> Yeah, so everybody was right. It's true, but it's sort of a trick question because NICE has um, very sophisticated technology appraisal processes and mechanisms that are really used more for pharma. So I think only since 2010, maybe five devices and told have gone through these technology appraisals, and they actually are mandatory and legally binding to the NHS to implement them if they're positive. What most devices go through, um, if they go through anything at all, are called guidances. So there's interventional procedural guidance as well as medical technology guidance, and they look at the clinical efficacy, safety, and cost, and a positive uh, recommendation by NICE is not legally binding. They recommend and can strongly recommend to the NHS to fund it, and then it's really up to the, the local CCG level to do so, but they don't often, they don't have to do that by law. Although I will add, a lot of other countries do look to NICE, and they view a positive um, rec recommendation sometimes even more strongly than they do within the country. Okay, great, all right. So now to the fun part. So Leslie, we're going to put you on the spot. And you have some, a very interesting story to share with the audience about trials and tribulations of going through reimbursement process in Australia. So like how do you want to move the slides? Uh, yeah. Um, there we go. Oh, there we go. Thank you, thank you. Thanks. OK, so I'm going to share very quickly here um, the history of reimbursement for the absorbed bioresorbable vascular scaffold in Australia. And I essentially am the not what to do <laughs> option of our program, or please learn faster than I did option of our program, whichever you prefer. But this is truly the, um, we, we had an interesting experience. So we'll start with, and I know many of you in the room are familiar with it. I think there are many people in the room who worked on this product. But I just want to quickly give you, a, for those of you who are not as familiar, it is a fully bioresorbable vascular scaffold, which essentially um, is a stent that goes away. It is fully metabolized in the vessel um, through the Krebs cycle. So essentially within three years, it's completely gone. 
Um, I'm not gonna go through the messaging here, but the key point that I wanted to put up with the messaging here is this is um, the marketing messaging currently. And we talked a little bit earlier today, um, I think it was Cecile who said innovation for innovation's sake is no longer meaningful. Um, this was not necessarily innovation for innovation's sake. There are, and there's a lot of people in this room who strongly believe in the concept of having go away will add clinical value. However, when we designed our clinical studies, we designed them for fast regulatory approval. So all of them are non-inferiority studies. Hence, the marketing messages, they're all about potential and future and we hope, um, which doesn't necessarily create the strongest value proposition, which it doesn't necessarily move to the strongest reimbursement proposition. Why should we pay more? Um, or even the same, when we have drug eluting stents and they're great. Um, so here is our lovely history of absorb reimbursement in Australia. Key takeaways, four submissions, five years. Probably not the story anybody wants to be telling. Um, okay, so first and foremost, I think important to note is where TGA or the regulatory approval was in this reimbursement process. Again, we had two submissions prior to TGA approval. Again, probably not where you wanna be. I think what we, what we learned very early on, and this was both a regulatory challenge as well as a reimbursement challenge, so it wasn't like we weren't talking to each other and I just hoped that they were gonna get approval. Um, we, so for CE Mark, we got approval, as many of people in the room do, we got approval with 62 patients. Um, that's obviously not a lot of patients, but it was possible with 62 patients. Um, in, in the past, in Australia, it kind of followed along that time. So we submitted our first submission um, for reimbursement in that same kind of time that we expected our regulatory approval. We were denied, flat out denied. We did it with 62 patients as well, and I think some key takeaways. First and foremost, I think we were thinking about it very similar to a regulatory submission. We were thinking that if we prove safety and efficacy in a small number of patients, we would be okay. Um, two things that we learned very quickly is no, they wanted more. And number two, politics are so incredibly important here. Key takeaway, probably not idea, great idea to piss off your only interventional cardiologist on the advisory committee two months before. Regardless of the situation, we can argue how we did it right or wrong, but it's probably not the best plan. There's one interventional cardiologist on the prosthesis list advisory committee for cardiology he was an investigator of ours. We made him a little angry at us. So politically, even if they were willing to accept the 62 patients, he was not gonna let it happen. Absolutely not gonna let it happen. Another key takeaway, this is just as political as it is clinical data and value messaging. And once you create a bad political situation, you need to invest a lot of years to pull it back out. So that was kind of key takeaway of submission number two. So we started working on those two things. Submission, and oh, so then the other reason why, um, in submission number one, they said, we're just really worried about your safety. We're absolutely really worried about your safety. So with submission number two, we brought on a consultant. So previously to that, it was me, um, about eight months into my transition into reimbursement, followed by um, a commercial person. So our general manager, our marketing manager, and our regulatory person who kind of filled in with reimbursement between 2 and 4 a.m. Um, and so that was a submission number one. Submission number two, we brought on a consultant, somebody that was absolutely recommended who lived in Washington, D.C. <laughs> okay, so it seems pretty obvious, <laughs> but like, find somebody who actually knows what they're doing on the ground. Hands down, no questions asked. You can understand a system living farther away. I understand the Australian system much better now. I wouldn't hire me to be your Australian reimbursement consultant. I have a good one if you need one. <laughs> um, but you need somebody who understands and can actually talk to the people in the government on the prosthesis listing committee, understand what's going around to help advise you. So understanding and having true in-country experience, I don't care how smart you are, I don't care how smart your commercial organization is, if things are swirling, having that person who can pick up the phone and call their friend who works at that place, who can talk to that other person who gets the total scoop, is really important. So key takeaway from the second submission. We, they said to us, your safety is the problem. So rather than kind of figuring out what the actual problem was, 
we hired, and I highly recommend my second consultant for other things, largely inside the United States, but we hired a great consultant and we threw everything we could at safety. I think we threw about 117 clinical papers at an organization made up of strictly non-interventional cardiologists who understood, they're like, <laughs> we're not reading this. We were declined again. Two things again, not understanding our, our, our customer and not understanding the politics. Really good news, somewhere in there we finally figured out the regulatory piece and we got regulatory approval. For those of you who are aware, in Australia there's a public and private market. Once you have regulatory approval, you're available in the public market. So we've been selling in the public market for quite some time. The private market, which is the market that we really want to be in, is not accessible to us at this time. So we actually contemplated a, f a um, fifth submission in between, um, actually that's not true, sorry, we did the third submission. Um, we got a little smarter. We met with the um, chair of the plaque, the press releases listing committee. And just to give you some idea about value matters, and maybe we hadn't articulated our value as well as we could. So he is a clinical cardiologist. Um, he has very little information on interventional cardiology. And literally during the two hour meeting that we had with him, which by the way was the longest one that, we, that apparently they had ever granted. So they were willing to give us the time. But he literally said to us, and this is my favorite quote of the entire absorb process for which I've been on for about 10 years. Um, so it goes away. My fingernails go away when I cut them too. Why would I want to approve this? Which is like this heartbreaking moment. Of like you've worked on something for 10 years and you know it'll be good for patients and he equated it to cutting his nails. I was like, oh my God. It was one of those moments where you're sitting in the room and you're like, do not react. Do not react, do not react. Um, but I think it was a really key takeaway on your value proposition needs to matter more than just, we had developed our value proposition for our interventional cardiology segment. We hadn't necessarily thought about this customer in a completely different light. And so we needed to really, really sit down and rethink it. We got a lot of points for going in and listening to him. I think we got a lot of points for sitting down and taking our, because we got a lot of that during those two hours. But we contemplated a fourth submission in between three and four, which we walked away from, thank God, we got a little smarter there. So fourth submission, what How did we do How many that you're allowed, by the way? Like, can you keep on going? Oh, apparently, you can go on seven. forever, apparently. <laughs> okay. They were as sick of us as we were of this process. Like, literally, they didn't want to see us again unless they could approve us. But, so between three and four, we got really smart. We had spent a lot of time with them. At this point, our regulatory 164th reimbursement person, um, who probably expanded that to probably about 1-8th reimbursement person, was on first name basis and could pick up and call the administrator for the plaque. We found and have a great reimbursement consultant who truly understands the plaque process. For those of you who understand Australia, there's multiple different processes. Our consultant cannot do the MSAC process, but they can do the plaque process. So it's very specific when you're looking for a really good consultant on the ground. Um, but um, we spent a lot of time. We hired a market development person in Australia. It, they needed it for commercial, but we also put her on influence mapping. And her first influence mapping job, and you, you can do formal influence mapping, like very fancy, bring in a lot of third party vendors, those kinds of things, where you can sit down and go, who does this person talk to? Which is what we did. We sat down and, we sat down and tried to figure out who influenced who. We came up with a two year plan with consistent messaging to get to the right people to create, a, and we created a strong value story that focused on that message. We also had really good advice, and we spent a lot of time understanding what mattered to them. And what mattered to them is they didn't want to deny it again. They didn't want to have to look at the people who wanted it and say, we are your barrier. They needed a strong backing. They felt, the plaque, the reimbursement body felt like TGA the regulatory body had made a mistake in approving this. So we had to deal with basically redoing a regulatory process and a reimbursement process for the reimbursement body. And so we went through that process. And the other thing that we, as we listened to them very carefully is we learned that they didn't want to be too far behind the United States. It was really important for them, the United States is super slow, they didn't want to be behind the United States. Hence the reason why you have FDA panel in there. 
Um, FDA panel for us was a huge success. We had a unanimous recommendation for FDA approval. And I'm literally sitting in the audience of the FDA panel texting my Australia team with the results because 45 minutes after the vote, they were sitting in front of the plaque explaining to them the results. We had our fourth submission, which was very carefully vetted with them ahead of time, even though they swore they would never do it, they did. Um, and the, the cardiology group that advises the plaque meets first. They approved it, plaque approved it, and actually last week was our first private sale in Australia. So you get there. <laughs> you get there. But you learned a lot along the way. This is a lot of learnings. But all of this, I truly, <laughs> I will tell you, I will never do this again. And <laughs> this applies pretty much to every place I go moving forward. Reimbursement has to be part of the development and clinical strategy. Um, and at Abbott Vascular, um, with the exception of a very small group that somebody in this room tried to beg us to move that direction, um, it was really not taken seriously for a very long time. I was the first hire in what we currently call health economics and reimbursement, and that came five years ago. Obviously, this product, the development, and the clinical study started a long time ago. We need to be talking about all of this earlier at the time where you're developing the product and starting clinical strategy, and that's reimbursement. If you're not going to get paid, you can't do anything. But you should also be talking about value. I absolutely think you should be talking about how you develop a clinical study to develop a value message. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, it can add lots of time. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of time. So either figure out how you, what you're doing really, really quickly or get professional help and get the right kind of professional help. Um, societies, KO advocates, patient advocates, we, we employed all of those in between number three and number four. And knowing who influences who is so incredibly important. And again, it can be super formal and there's lots of people who do it incredibly well. Or you can sit around a room in a place like Australia where there's not that many interventional cardiologists <laughs> and clinical cardiologists and talk about who talks to who and who listens to who and figure it out from there. So there's cheap ways and there's expensive ways to do that. Um, it's more than just an application. I cannot stress the political nature of this and I think everybody here will agree. The political nature or the relationship building nature or the influence nature is so important to this as well. Hence the society's KOLs and patients. I mean, I think we heard this morning, patients have a lot to say, and people listen to them more and more every day. So patient advocates are really important as well. Government relationships. So one other point that I'll just make on the government relationships, somewhere between three and four, we figured out that the government really didn't like us all that much. You could argue it took us a little long time to figure that out. But we actually embarked on a whole plan to build a stronger relationship with the government of Australia. And we actually, figuring out what they wanted, they were very interested in underserved populations. So we have invested very heavily and continue to do so. It wasn't just tied to this. A women's heart health education program in the country of Australia in partnership with the government. So they are very excited about that ongoing and that builds a relationship that allows you to get more information. And then lastly, the internal team needs to be really working together. When I sit in California and my commercial team sits in Sydney, which really is not great time zone wise. Um, you need to have an incredible amount of trust. You need to be sharing everything. You need to be talking regularly and not that my family loves this. You need to be willing to go get on a plane and spend some significant time there. And um, those relationships are just as important as well. Great. Right. Fantastic. <laughs> willing to share all the, the you can get yeah, there, hopefully hopefully like, faster. You know, um, going through reimbursement. So I just wanted to first open up to the panel to see what questions that you might have. Um, Leslie, we will have a Q&A session at the end, but in, um, I do want to limit the questions right now for Leslie um, in the interest of going to Katya's case, and then again, you know, we'll open it up to Q&A at the end. So, but anybody, you know, the panelists on their questions? I have, I have a question. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role that economic data played, if at all, in, in all of the different submissions in Australia, knowing that they do have an HTA body and they do look a bit at um, cost and cost effectiveness? Absolutely none. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. Um, so we submitted, for our plaque application, we submitted no economic data. Once we had a positive CAG or the, the cardiology advisory group recommendation, mm -hmm. we were asked to submit a economic dossier. It was a little bit of a surprise to me, so again, learning. 
ask all the questions about what comes next, too. So I literally got a call on a Sunday and said, we have 48 hours to submit an economic dossier. I was like, great. That's awesome. <laughs> um, the person who worked for me had just resigned. <laughs> it was pretty much me, myself, and I. Um, but what, it, what essentially came down to is we submitted a cost analysis, which yeah. was more than enough. Um, interestingly enough, I did get a call this morning on the drive here saying, Australia's thinking about doing an HTA next month. What's your feeling on that? So even when you're done, you're not always done. Um, and so literally this morning we put together an argument as to why we should not go to HTA, not the least of which is NICE has chosen not to go to HTA, so you shouldn't do it either. Um, but um, very little economic data was required. What they wanted was a value story. Mm -hmm. They wanted the safety and efficacy. Again, we had to redo our regulatory aspect for plaque because they felt the TGA had jumped the gun. But we also needed to create at least a va enough value that they felt like they were doing the right thing. So it didn't have to be economic. That being said, I will also say that's completely, as you well know, completely untrue in a lot of other countries. For, I have a question. So if you're not Abbott, you work for a smaller company, which many of us do, and you tried a couple times and you fell, did you guys ever think about like just kind of abandoning it at that point and say like, you know what, it's just not worth the trouble or was it still too important? No. We did not, and and to your point though, we actually have you know probably fifty full time people in Australia who, for them to meet their goals, needed to do this. Um, we didn't actually invest that much money in um, that process. So we didn't invest that. I mean, our consultants—they're not cheap or free, but they weren't the most expensive. Um, it was mostly our time, and so no, we didn't. Consider not. Okay, great, great. Yeah, let's move on to Katia. I'm sure you guys are thinking about like all the questions you want me to ask, and we'll try to give you some time at the end. But um, so Katia, do you need to? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going uh, to present a case study on one of our clients, which is Inspire Medical Systems. So it's. Um, a treatment for uh, patients with sleep apnea. So Inspire uh, was formed in 2007 as a spin-off of Medtronic. Um, so it's a US-based company, as many, well, almost most of our clients. It's, um, so the therapy, it's really the first implanted neurostimulation device uh, that was also approved by FDA, as you remarked earlier, uh, for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea by a hypoglossal nerve stimulation, and it's really filling a therapeutic gap, so where there is no other treatment option. So it adds an option to those patients who could not be successfully um, treated with a CPAP or uh, just cannot tolerate this treatment. And there's, um, looking at, we are looking now at Germany, it's um, quite a significant addressable market, so it's um, 7,000 really new patients per year who are suitable for this treatment. And there is a pool of 100,000 patients um, that are C CPAP non-responders or could not tolerate it at all. And already on this slide, I have um, pointed out two important points and uh, will show the process on the next slide. So it uh, was for this company, it was really extremely important and good that they did an early and huge investment into a very good study showing the efficacy of this method because it was really a new method, treatment method. And this led to a very, very good publication which was recognized as a top 10 uh, clinical research achievement award. And um, they faced a somewhat amazing challenge. <laughs> That's why I pointed it out there. And this treatment, it, um, needs to be uh, performed, it, it needs two, two groups of physicians, two specialties. So because these patients, they are typically treated by the somnologists, sleep experts, they are, let's say, owning the disease. <laughs> and uh, the implantation needs to be done by the ENT experts. And uh, the ENT experts, their comment basically was, yes, OSA, that's not our topic. We don't focus on that, and uh, the somnologists initially their position was, no, looks promising, but it's not for us because we cannot implant that. 
So it was a typically um, medical uh, societies or physician groups are competing for patients. Here, nobody really seemed to be <laughs> get involved. So uh, the first step was to get them involved to, um, to approach this in an interdisciplinary approach. So this was very important in the interdisciplinary approach here. So how did it go? This needs some um, explanation. I will do my best to um, guide you through this even without a pointer. <laughs> <laughs> so let's mainly focus, uh, important as a green field. So it all started in 2010 with the CE mark and there was still a um, phase two trial just completed. In, um, and the phase three trial was started which was completed in 2014, which was a very important milestone. What, what happened in Germany in the meantime? So if you have a new procedure, and it was definitely a new procedure, um, it needs a procedure coding. And this um, needs to be done, or at least strongly supported. No, it, I mean, it has to be done <laughs> by the medical societies, some exception. But um, there was, I mean, you know, it, it took two um, times until it finally was successful. And um, there is um, a very general coding for the peripheral nerve stimulation. And um, actually the organization, the authority who is giving these codes, they try to put everything in there if possible. So it nearly needs a strong story and also strong support by the medical society with good statements until it got approved then in the second year. And um, then in the middle column of the, what happened in Germany, it's a famous loop approach. I heard already heard many of you talking about it. So this, um, the NUV is given by that authority our organization, and it's basically being done based on calculation data, cost data they received from hospitals. And um, they noticed, well, there is something new, but we cannot, we cannot really understand it. So that's why they gave the status four, which is, um, I mean, when, when you look at the new, what you want is a one, what you do not want is a two, and the four is something in between. So it was uh, very um, interesting. And it's for, for them, it's, it's important, again, then, that they see a procedure code where they can base on um, their calculations. And it also tells them, OK, there definitely is a support by medical societies. And that's, um, so that's the basis for this um, for getting the procedure code was the support of the medical societies and that again was an important signal to the other organization giving um, the NUB1 status in the end. So this was a very big milestone and uh, we could convince them when all this was available. And uh, with that, I mean also in the, the NUB1, as you know, it's a hospital individual application and it also needs hospital individual negotiations with the health insurances. That's why it's um, in the right column, it's between black and green, <laughs> because of course um, um, the next step then will be um, to um, create um, utilization of the procedure that's important. And then based on that and visibility through costs associated to an OPS code that makes it visible to the to that authority, and then um, we expect that next year we will see a DRG for it or a supplemental fee, which is a ZE. Some of you might have heard that. <laughs> and um, so this um, it was quite a long way. Um, the company only started in 2012 to involve really um, local people. So um, one could have uh, <laughs> done this a little earlier, maybe that would have helped, or there's a good chance this would have helped to speed up this process and the discussion with the medical societies and um, to, to get this um, somewhat earlier. 
And on the other hand, on the right side, just for comparison of timelines, we have shown what happened in the US in the meantime to um, so when, when we received the PMA, and now it's also a reimbursement situation uh, which depends on prior authorization per case. And so it shows there, it's, uh, from the timing, it, it's parallel because it's such a, it was such a new therapy, actually, and um, that, that needed, just needed some time for evidence, so it can happen with new therapy. That is, the process between CE mark and full reimbursement is not that different from what we see in, in the US. So on the next slide, is here I've summarized um, some of the learnings. I mean, um, yeah, the first one I've already mentioned. So um, it is, um, we are heard, heard in an earlier panel, it's an easy market. Um, to some extent, yes, but to some, but the, there, um, you need to handle it very well and carefully and um, get into the considerations very early. And it also depends on the degree of innovation of the therapy. And um, the, of course, the strong involvement of the medical societies is really essentially required. And uh, interdisciplinarity can be quite challenging to bring them together. Yes, and um, another challenge is it's really different authorities need to be managed um, in more or less in parallel, one after the other, which is uh, dimly giving the OPS codes, the organization um, for NUB and DRG, and in future also the GBA doing benefit as patient benefit assessments will, will kick in even further also for hospital reimbursement questions. And yeah, because of the complexity of the market access process, really, which also was shown there, it's it's really important, and um, yeah, that we don't hear this the first time today. <laughs> it's really very, really important to involve the local market access experts um, who, who understand these local mechanisms in detail. And yeah, also uh, I would even add as a separate point, um, it's important to involve them on time, and um, not at a stage when. Uh, People are frustrated and discover we are struggling with our market access. So yeah, that's that was a key, short key learning from this case. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to again invite some of the panelists um, with any questions um, or comments um, about this case. I got a question. So maybe Anne or Naomi can actually comment on this. So you know, um, earlier today we were talking about things like sleep apnea and even some of the other medical spaces or clinical segments like fertility or weight loss or whatnot, where even in the US, some payers pay for it and others don't because they, some people may not really see it strictly as on the same level of need as oncology or cardiac procedures or whatnot. So in some of, for example, the emerging markets like Brazil, for example, some of the Asia, how would a payer view something like sleep apnea in general? What type of process or evidence or whatnot? Um, I know it's a big topic, but maybe just a quick sort of comment. I think with some of the products um, and devices and things, if, it's, if it is a little more niche, there may be a thought to approach the private payer market because I think with, so for example in Brazil, 20% of the population falls into the private payer market. So there is, because of the population of Brazil, there is some density there in which you could get some traction, a little bit like the United States, right? You need to get the buy-in, you need to get patients using it, you need to get KOLs advocating for it. So that might be a strategy for those more niche products that are really talking about a very specific patient population. But it does bring me to the question of, and I think for both case studies, about why those markets were selected for those products. Um, I worked on an HIV product in Brazil. That's an amazingly good fit in the sense that Brazil has one of the best HIV programs in the world. Um, it does make the conversations very sophisticated and um, a, a little bit challenging too because they get a lot of 
um, offers to integrate different therapies and devices into that program, and obviously they cover a very large population. But I think tiering your product launches for the market, there's a lot of factors, and I think that really speaks to the idea that when you're looking at your product, there has to be a really thoughtful and deliberate plan of what markets you're looking to go into. Um, I worked at Novartis Diagnostics, they did blood screening. And blood screening machines can be quite large, they have a huge footprint. Maybe not so good in markets where the laboratory space is so small. So they started innovating a product that actually would match the footprint of some of the labs that they were looking to place these machines in. So I think you know one, one of the things is that it, it's, it's a culmination of factors, but I think matching the market with your product launch plan and all the aspects of it is really essential. And, and the only thing I guess I would add is when it's all about thinking about the need within a given market, and I think there's a lot of ways to figure out which markets you should go after, but they all, I think when you're thinking through that analysis, it all starts with really understanding what's going on in the market. Beyond, you know, market access even itself, a lot of people think just refers to reimbursement, or maybe it includes pricing, but maybe it's just the, the data around your technology. And I think that's sort of part of the problem, because market access is much bigger than that. It's almost a, a patient access. It, it includes some market development activities. It goes well beyond the clinical and economic value of a technology, but really thinking about um, you know, infrastructural considerations in a given market that might influence access, meaning maybe there's some, something around physician training, uh, maybe it's environmental considerations that you have to think about awareness. Is there a low level of awareness of even the disease or the condition? And all of those factors need to be understood in addition to the political climate, the economy, to really understand what is going on in that market and, and what is the need. And then how can you um, demonstrate value of your technology to really best meet that need? Because having the best data in the world, I think the clinical data from your case study certainly, I mean, you can have really good data and still have a really difficult time getting funding. Um, and I think that, you know, if what we've seen is a lot of companies, too, are thinking about how can we work together with um, a government to put in place some types of partnerships where we can address part of the, the issues they're having that concern the patients within a given condition, which ultimately will help us in the end because more patients are coming through to get surgery or whatever it is and use our technology but we're helping them address an upfront need, and we've seen a lot of examples of these strategic partnerships um, across industry and certainly by, by a lot of the big players. But I do think, it, it, you know, for me, it's about really understanding the context of the market, the needs of the market, and then really um, making deliberate choices for which markets to enter into and, and when and why. Great, all right. So that leads us, actually, that's a great segue um, to the um, top 10 do's and don'ts, um, because I think you know, we touched on all these points uh, through the case studies and through the comments, but we just wanted to quickly run through them. Um, you know, if you want to have copies of these, you know, by all means, reach out to us. We'll be happy to make them available uh, for you. Um, so as the panel said here, Leslie, start early, huh? and incorporating this into your overall strategy. I mean, you emphasize how important that is. Maybe just a quick comment um, on that. I mean, if, if we had to go back and do this exactly the way we wanted, we would be talking about how we would demonstrate clinical superiority back in 2005. Four, three. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie used to be in charge of the program. <laughs> We're not playing the blank game, by the way. Um, so. No, I mean, it just, this, it's learning, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. again, I was the very first hire into this group as we kind of created a market access health economics group five years ago. And we started this project in 2002, 2003. You only can do what you know. I think we did the best we could, but mm. hindsight's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, number two, research into what's valued by payers and stakeholders in each target market. And as a consultant, how often do you have to kind of change that depending on which market are you, you're talking about? 
I think I think you often do because uh, you know there's you talked a lot about the influence maps and I think that that's you can't underscore the importance of really understanding the different stakeholders in a given market across different sectors. The the public sector and the private sector might have some of the same stakeholder groups and, and types of people, but their motivations, their incentives and disincentives could be um, very different. So you have to really do your research and understand um, and map out what is meaningful to them, what, what are their needs and what really resonates in terms of value so that you know then how you can influence that and, and ultimately that's going to just support your technology. And also how, how they influence each other, I think, is also a very important dynamic and, and differs by market and sector. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, defining a value proposition, and again, telling that, I think that you know, also speaks to you know, what you just said. Um, Leslie already touched on planning, you know, in that design, the health economics, the reimbursement, the pay your side of things um, into your clinical study, if you can at all, um, to do that, great. Um, I yeah, comment about sure. that. An interesting thing we were talking about earlier, I just came back from Asia, I was at an ISPOR meeting in Singapore a few days ago, and they don't normally talk about HTAs for medical devices in the same context as pharma. Um, they do it all the time for pharma, and I think it's very, it's still pretty new for, for med tech, but they talked a lot about it, and this was a, a conference tailored to the Asia Pacific markets, but I do think we're going to see more of that, certainly as these markets are facing pretty significant cost constraints with their aging populations, with a lot of, I guess you can't even generalize because every market is so different, but certainly aging is, is a big factor in, in some of those markets. And I think that they did talk about um, new committees that are being set up and HTAs that are being set up specifically to look at cost and cost effectiveness, although I don't think they're quite there on the cost effectiveness front for devices, but certainly cost and maybe budget impact um, studies for, for med tech in their local population. So I think that's something that as a community with med tech we'll have to consider and think about factoring in earlier into the development plans. There's no question about that. Just, just as you guys are thinking about tactically, just this year the very first HTAs for devices are happening for Japan, yeah. Korea, China, and Singapore. Singapore. Yeah. So you have to be thinking about that. You said if you can incorporate health economics into your clinical, I, I actually have to. feel very strongly yeah. about saying you can't not. You absolutely can't not. And it's not rocket science, you guys. If, if it's not something that you feel totally comfortable with, find someone who can help you. It won't cost a ton. And it, I mean, there's plenty of people even up here who will advise on that kind of thing. Um, so you can't not do it in your first clinical trial anymore. I realize the time is running out, so I'm just going to go through quickly the others, you know, because I do really want to leave some time for questions. Um, all these panels emphasize the importance of having the key societies, the KOLs, you know, building that. And you can't just build it in two weeks' time. You have to really nurture that throughout the years. Don't underestimate the time effort. You know, if you knew well ahead of time it's going to take you seven years, you might actually even make a different decision about whether it's worth your while. Or is it a strategic priority for your company, especially if you're a small one, so think about that one. Don't assume that your experience from eight years ago applies. Things change all the time. In uh, China, it changes in three weeks. Every week, every <laughs> week. Uh, don't assume that the same study model applies all across, and politics, 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 and everything that these guys who are experts still say, get expert help. I mean, they, again, nobody knows everything about every market, so reach out and get help. All right, so I'm going to open up for Q&A. What questions do we have? Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. Any parting words uh, from our panelists? Okay. okay. <laughs> Since you need a question, I have one. Um, one of the challenges that I had a couple of years ago um, in working for a small company who did not have a sales and marketing organization in Europe, we were trying to, and to prioritize which countries we would go to first. And very quickly it emerged that reimbursement would be a main driver of that prioritization process. And so I'm interested in your perspective. 
which ones would you, which, what would be the top three in Europe that you would go to and how would you arrive at that? Katya? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it's um, the first part of your question or your, your introductory words are an uh, extremely important point. So I think in the process of prioritization, it's, um, it's really um, helpful for you if you get a quick analysis of the most important countries of, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, of the most important countries and really look where would you f potentially fit into the existing um, reimbursement scheme or if there is, is a chance already to make use of that, that may influence your prioritization. And um, then as the next step, of course, there are certain big countries where you look at first, so it's always uh, Germany, UK is one of the, as we heard, easier ones. <laughs> and, but also Netherlands can be a very attractive market. So, and um, also depending on what, um, yeah, what really the, the technology is and what the benefit is, it could also be Spain, Spain and Italy. It really depends on, on the technology. But the quick analysis, um, a very superficial analysis with respect to new technology from um, several markets. That's a good starting point to, um, let's say, have a bit more than an educated guess as a basis for your prioritization. And I might add to that 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 tiering could be really informed by, um, you know, burden of illness studies in that particular country and looking at the prevalence data. And so I think that you don't have to make it a stab in the dark, that you can use some of those. And there are resources like even the World Health Organization, you can just go and look at statistics that might tell you what the major problems are in those, the health problems that are impacting those countries, and use that even as a rough cut. And then you could use those to narrow those down to figure out what countries. And when you're resource constrained, you do need to make some choices. So you do want to make sure that you're looking at all of that data and not, you know, even if you can only do a rough cut, it'll at least get you sort of started. Yeah. And the only other thing I would add is someone earlier said um, it's also about strategic fit and really how you define success because success to you might not be um, in one market what it is in another. And by that I mean, you know, if you think about Spain or Italy, in Spain in particular, we see some companies getting pretty good access and good penetration of their technologies at a few centers, um, even though it's a little bit more patchy than some of the other markets because they find that it's easier to enter into and, and get approval. All right. yep. Susan. But because when, um, let's say, it's a, it's a treatment for a, for a disease, typically no um, patient of the statute, which is, who is insured by the statutory health insurers, and that's 90% of the population, would agree to any payment out of their pocket. So, so it's, um, and going to the privately insured, that's now also having, let's say, a limitation to what's paid for them. There's, uh, there are a few more options, but you would, it would be a limitation to a very small niche. So that wouldn't really be a success. So yes. So it was self-pay, yes. I mean, the obvious two markets that you can have early success with self-pay are India and China. Mm -hmm. um, I would argue a couple of things along that. You still have to have a value message, right? In those countries, you're looking at physicians who are selling to people who are saying, I am taking 100% of the cost of my, your product and the procedure. So not just like if your product's $1,000, but if the whole procedure's $7,000, you're asking them to pay $8,000 out of their bank account. 
um, to get your product. And so you need to provide your physicians with a way to sell it. I mean, I actually think about this every day because I was having a conversation with a distributor in Cambodia and was asking about how we get on the market. And he finally said to me, Leslie, these people are talking about whether they sell the car, the cow, sorry, sell the cow or give grandpa a stick. And so you have, to, you have to give them a value proposition that matches the value that the people will bring to it. And so if it's grandpa lives, then that might be something. If a grandpa might feel better one day next week, maybe the cow's more important. So I think you have to really be thinking about the value. And it was also brought up earlier today. So my market is obviously coronary stents. And I think you brought it up. But the Indian government is now starting to say, stents are essential to everybody. <laughs> We're going to lower the price, and we're going to regulate you. So things that used to be a lot more free for all are becoming more and more and more focused and regulated, particularly if you save lives. So to, to your board, it's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> so on that note, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, so I wanted to, again, thank my fellow panelists um, and everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Mika, and, and all of the experts who st still, we clearly need all of you because the reimbursement's not going to go away anytime soon in terms of the challenge. And from what we uh, just heard from Leslie, <laughs> there's a lot of things that we can do differently um, from, from that standpoint.